Hey everyone, it's so exciting to see this room absolutely full. I was here last year, it's great to see it um, growing. Um, today I want to talk about what happens after you've built something that successfully solves a problem for people. So you have software that's live in production, uh, it's going to stay there for a while, but you can't just ship it and forget it. You need to keep things up to date, whether it's small changes like library upgrades and patching, or larger changes like migrating to some new technology. And honestly, I don't think anyone gets excited about this. You don't think, fantastic, I'm going to spend a quarter upgrading 100 microservices to the new version of this library. And making changes that require other teams to do work is even worse, because it's the hardest type of project. You have to get everyone else aligned to do something that they're also not excited about. But getting it right matters. If you don't upgrade, you put your organization at risk. You might be running on unsupported versions. You might be running on something that has a security vulnerability. And migrations are essential. You need to respond to technical debt. You need to take advantage of changes in the technology. You might be forced to do it because something's been deprecated or decommissioned. And sometimes you just realize that you're on the wrong thing. You made the wrong choice, or it's no longer the right choice. You have to do some work. Will Larson uh, pointed out, though, if you can't handle migrations effectively, you slow down the whole of your organization. It's very easy for teams to get overwhelmed with the amount of change that they need to manage, leaving them little time to focus on the business capabilities that actually matter. We need to keep things up to date, but how we approach this can really impact the flow for our engineering teams. And it's something I think is particularly important to realize for platform teams, because if you work building a platform, often what you're doing is upgrading or migrating people. You have to get good at that. I've been working as a software engineer for a long time. This is what the Apple website looked like when I started work. Um, in the early days, I was writing enterprise Java beans. Anyone re remember that? <laughs> Um, deploying them to an application server running in a data center. The first source control software I used was SourceSafe. Uh, you had to check files out, so if someone else had checked it out, you couldn't do anything. Um, releases were big bang, they took hours, although I was never involved in that process. I checked my code in and some other team built, deployed, and ran that software for me. Things look very different now. Um, so Agile, the cloud, DevOps, microservices, containers, there's all this change that's happened in the last 20 years last 10 years that made it much quicker to go from an idea to live code in production. Development teams have a lot more autonomy, but they also have a lot more responsibilities. There is no separate team that's uh, maintaining and operating our systems anymore. It's a good thing. But every system you're running in production needs continuing investment. It's not done until it's not running in production anymore. And even if you're not adding new features, you have to keep things up to date. Spent over a decade working for the Financial Times, one of the world's leading business newspapers, and pretty much all of that time I was building some form of platform. So I started out working for the Content API, um, building APIs that the website and our B2B partners used. Um, I've put it there as a streamlined team, but actually it's a platform from the perspective of the website. And then I moved to be in charge of platform engineering. So all of the teams that were building the, the tools that are needed to build and run code in production. You have to get good at migrations and upgrades if you're doing these kinds of roles. Upgrades and patching. Well, modern software has a lot of dependencies, which means a lot of things to upgrade, particularly if you adopt a microservice architecture. We use open source libraries. We have to upgrade our programming language. We might have multiple languages. We may have multiple databases that we need to keep up to date. We run on servers where we may have to upgrade the image, the hardware, the Kubernetes version. And finally, our services interact with other services. So you might have to change the library that talks to the database, even if you're not actually having to upgrade that database. Many of these upgrades are on someone else's timetable. Using code written and maybe even run by someone else is great. It saves your time and effort. And it's likely that something that someone wrote specifically for a use case is better than something your team is going to build, honestly. And you get to focus on key outcomes for your business. But we don't control the life cycle. You may have to upgrade at relatively short notice. Um, I'm sure many of you here have had some piece of software that you're using where the company got acquired, or someone suddenly said, yeah, actually, in a year's time, this is not going to exist anymore. Then there are the bigger changes, the migrations from one tool or library to another. Maybe you're changing database, you're changing hosting platform. These are complicated projects. They can take months or even years to complete. Something like moving your source control software from Bitbucket to GitHub, which is a thing that, that I went through. Everyone has to do work for it. 
So I have three things I want to talk about. Um, firstly, timing. How do you decide when it's the right time to do a migration? Uh, secondly, foundations. What can you put in place so that you're minimizing the effort for doing upgrades and migrations? And finally, execution. What can you what can you do to make it more likely you'll be successful in getting everyone migrated on time and without everyone hating you? But first I want to tell you about a migration project that happened about five years ago at the FT. It was being run by another team. I was actually a stakeholder. Uh, this other team were responsible for much of the software used um, every day by FT employees. And one of the things they managed was the CRM system. And like a lot of companies, the FT had ended up treating it as a platform, building lots of other functionality on top of it, even when that didn't actually make sense. It wasn't the best way to, to solve this. We had a CRM, so we'd shove everything into it. So this team had decided this was not good. Maybe we should buy some software that was custom built to solve these particular problems. And it affected me because the systems used for tracking operational incidents and for tracking changes lived in this CRM, as well as other things like our service desk tickets. And I was quite excited. I thought, yeah, this is great because I hate this kind of system we've got right now. This is going to be much better for me. Um, that, that'll be cool. But seven months in, we cancelled the project. We wrote off the investment of time and money, we renewed our contract with the existing supplier. So why did that happen? Mostly, it was about timing. To make it work, we needed to be able to get off that system before we had to sign the contract to renew it. And we just didn't feel confident that that was going to happen. Because while the service desk were really keen to get specialized IT service desk management, they were also managing the FT's move to a new office. And that was happening on a deadline. We weren't going to have fixed desks, so everyone had to have a laptop, everyone had to have soft phones, there was a whole new network to set up. They just couldn't spare the time to even think about what their needs were for a service desk tool. And moving to a new office is like high priority, time critical, very visible to everyone in your organization. That's got to be your focus. My own team, we actually knew that we wanted to change the way we did uh, both instant management and uh, change logging, but we weren't ready to start thinking about that yet. So the danger was we were going to have a lift and shift of a process that we didn't want to keep doing. There were always lots of things you could be doing at, at any quarter. And before committing to a migration, you should always be thinking, well, what am I not doing? What are the consequences if I don't do this or if I don't do it for another six months? What else could you or other teams be doing? So you have to understand what the product strategy is. Um, it is not good to go to a team and say, you need to move source control system when they've got a massive launch coming up. That, that they're going to be very uninterested in helping you. And you should always weigh up the costs against the benefits. So I quite often see people saying, you know, I really don't like this vendor. They don't respond to us very well. And there's this other vendor, and it's cheaper. And why don't we just move? Uh, but the question isn't whether it's better or cheaper. It's whether it's enough better and cheaper to spend a quarter doing the drudgery of moving everyone to this. And I remember Charity May just talking about this. I can't find it anywhere online. But she basically said, when you're thinking about migration, parity is not good enough. It's got to be way better because you're also changing everything else. You have to get over the disruption and the cost of moving it. Going back to that migration away from the CRM, it turns out that the... The needs for the operations team, my team, were, weren't very well understood by the vendors that we were talking to. So this is a graph of our releases to production. At that point, we were doing hundreds of releases a day. Uh, the new system only had a GUI. Um, and so you, got, you can't basically go and enter through a form all of the changes that you're doing. And they had an API, but it wasn't very well maintained. And actually, the vendors seemed a little bit mystified that you could actually achieve more than a couple of releases a week. So it wasn't just that the timing wasn't right. The new functionality wasn't going to support how we worked. And it turned out the cost savings were an illusion because we didn't understand quite how many people were using the CRM to do some kind of ticket tracking. Once you worked that out, you realized it was going to cost you a fortune, a fortune in licenses. It wasn't going to save us any money. So at this point, um, we are not improving the experience for anyone. We're not reducing risk. We're not reducing cost. So why am I telling you the story? I think you should be prepared to stop. It's vanishingly rare that I see people stop projects. Uh, but if you keep track of how you're doing, um, you, can, you should be prepared that you can stop. And actually, really like what our CTO, John, John Cundit, JK, said, which is he said, I'm not sad or disappointed. I don't see this as a failure at all. 
it was an example of successful leadership. We stopped before we were going, we thought we were going to fail, before it all went wrong. We didn't let the fact we'd spent time and money on this uh, and that the team would be upset because they'd invested all this work. We didn't let it um, we'd make us keep dragging through the project to something that no one was going to be happy with. I think it's a remarkable thing to actually say sunk cost fallacy, you know, ignore it. We are just not going to do this. Uh, JK also said, you know, we learned a lot. It's going to result in positive changes. By the time we, we abandoned the project, we actually understood far more about what we were looking for. What are we trying to achieve? But in the short term, we signed up for another year's contract. The team who had tried to do the migration moved on to other things. They, they had very little interest in tackling this problem. They were actually quite, quite upset about the whole thing. I don't blame them. It's really tough to do this, but it was the right decision. Clearly, I'm going to return to that story a bit later. But clearly, you can't avoid doing migrations. I'm not still writing enterprise Java beans. I'm very grateful for that. Um, there are things you need to do. So how do you set yourself up to be able to do it in the least painful way possible? What are the foundations you can set? Everything you need, everything you have needs to be owned. I actually feel like if there's one thing that, like, that I say to everybody the most in my career, it's like there should be ownership. A team should own a service. Nothing should be, should be um, unowned, and it should be documented. You should be able to go and find out, who do I talk to about this? And it needs to be actively owned. I think Matthew calls this continuous stewardship. Uh, you, the team needs to feel accountable, even if they're not actively developing the service, for upgrading, migrating, doing everything that it takes to run this service safely and securely in production. And if you don't have this active ownership, you end up with services that no one understands, running on out-of-date software. You may not even realize you have a vulnerability because no one is paying attention to it. And Orphan services don't get upgraded. Who's going to upgrade the service built four years ago that no one's touched since? So you don't want to find out that no one owns something until, when, until there's an urgent need to patch it. Um, you have to have a team that will patch and make code changes and handle migrations, even if this is not a service that you're actively changing. The next important thing is to know what's coming your way. So you don't have to drop everything because suddenly you discover that an urgent upgrade has to happen. And I've seen this happen quite a lot. A team suddenly realizes, oh, that database is going to go out of, uh, out of support in two months' time. If you work with vendors, you should make sure you know their roadmaps, just for, not just for what's coming, but for what is going. What are they going to deprecate? What are you not going to have anymore? And make sure you're aware of end-of-life dates for versions of other technology you use. This is great. This, is, this website just has it's an open source repository, gathers together information about versions of common software. You can go there and look, and it will tell you, well, when does this, when does this version go out, go out of date? And that could be really useful. For your own organization, uh, you can use your tech radar. And I've just used the Zalando one because it's, because it's available, it's open source, and you can see it. Tech radars keep track of the technology you're using. Um, zooming in a bit. You categorize your technology to say this is something you should be trying out, using in production, or moving away from. And if you have a migration going on, you really ought to have the, the tool you are moving away in the hold category and the one you're moving to in the adopt. It's a way of making sure everyone understands what's coming, what's coming, what they shouldn't start using. Because um, you really don't want to discover that someone actually moved to a technology that you were already planning to um, get rid of. You should be very clear about the expectations you have for uh, responding to needs. So, so for security-related patches, you could have a patching policy that says highly critical vulnerabilities are patched within two days, um, lower level ones within two weeks. Just be clear what, what the timeline is for people. For non-security-related stuff, you might say we don't run on unsupported versions of our programming language. or you could take a harder line and say we're, we're no more than one major version behind. But having that clarity for everyone means they need to think about when they have to plan this work in. Because I've been in, in a position where a team realized that they had left it so long they were having to upgrade um, a database and all the stored procedures uh, five years after it had been set up and, and they didn't understand it and it was like, we have to do this critically. That wouldn't have happened if there'd been a policy that said you don't let yourself drift so far away from the supported versions. It's not always a question of maximum time within a patching policy. You can also specify minimum time. And when I was running the content API team, we were using some pretty bleeding edge technology, and new versions came out all the time. Uh, sometimes a new version would come out while we were still doing the minor version upgrade 
the previous one. So we made a decision to wait a set time before applying any minor version upgrades so that we could batch them together because, because otherwise it just felt like a treadmill and it wasn't, it wasn't critical. We just needed to reduce the amount of effort it was taking for us. You can make choices in the way that you build stuff to try and handle inevitable changes better. We're not really very good at thinking about the long-term supportability and maintainability about stuff when we're buying it. More excited about what we get right now, but that can, that can be a useful thing to think about. You can choose managed services. If you are having someone else do some of the work for you, that's, that's really good. You don't have to patch the server, potentially. Um, it's a good principle to... Uh, buy things rather than build them, but, but there is a caveat, because you don't have to spend the time doing upgrades, but you also don't control when they happen. So you may have to deal with a breaking change at short notice, wrecking your, your plans. Overall though, highly recommend it. APIs over templates, this is something Abby Bangzer mentioned to me, um, and I think it's great. It's like, if you're using infrastructure as code for setting up new infrastructure, uh, standardize this is how tasks are executed, but people often aren't actually doing infrastructure as code. They are instead storing configuration files in source control. So if you provide a template to your customers uh, you lose, and you give, the, give it to them to execute, you lose control. They keep using it. They make changes to it. You no longer have that ability to, to upgrade. But if you put it behind an API, you have the ability for any new call to apply the changes you have made to that template. So. I want to talk about execution. How do you actually handle doing a migration? I'm really focusing on migrations because they're the, the more painful ones. Well, you need to make sure you're really clear on what it involves. You need to communicate and you need to think about and put, put, put yourself in your customer's shoes. So first, let's start with clarity. Why are you doing this work and why are you doing it now? If your boss thinks you're moving to the cloud for cost reasons, but you think it's for speed of delivering value, you're going to make quite different design decisions. It's important to realize which of those is the actual reason you're doing it. And once you're aligned, you can share that information with all the teams that are impacted. It really helps people to understand why you're doing it. It reduces the pushback. If you say, look, you know, I know that this is not what you want to do, but we have to move DNS provider because the other one is being deprecated. We didn't want to do it either. There are three constraints uh, for any project, schedule, cost, and scope. It's a good idea to know which of those is the most critical for the migration that you're doing, and if there's one that you really can't change. So as an example, we started using containers very early at the FT. We built our own container orchestration, not something I'd recommend. Um, nothing was available at the time. Uh, once Kubernetes was production ready, we wanted to move to it. Um, and for that, at that point, we wanted to move for cost reasons. We didn't want to be supporting our own orchestration. But then one of the key parts of it was declared end of life, and now we had a deadline. We had, our constraint was scheduled. We had to, we had to be off that before, before it was discontinued. You need to understand who needs to do work, what that work involves, how much effort is it, and also what else are they doing? What's their context? Will they prioritize this work? Can they even do that? And what are the consequences if you can't uh, hit the schedule or the cost? If we were late, or we cut scope, or we can't move on to working on the next thing, uh, what would it be the cost to us? So with that migration to Kubernetes, actually, we were really concerned about security uh, and patching, because once something's past, past end of life, there, there's no guarantee of what happens if a, if a vulnerability is found. So we had to be ruthless on scope. We had to build things in a fairly hacky way that meant doing manual work. It's true tech debt. We just needed to get across that line. Clarity really helps. It may help you realize you don't want to do this right now as well. Once you have that clarity, you have to communicate. Mostly teams do not do enough communication because they assume that everyone engages with whatever communication they send. I've known loads of teams that send an email and they're like, yeah, we, we emailed everybody. But people are on holiday. They missed the all hands meeting. They weren't in that Slack channel or email group. I know that everyone in prod and tech at the FT did not have everyone in prod and tech in it. People left it. Um, even if they got the email, they may not have paid attention because they didn't realize it was for them. So you have to repeat the message lots of different ways, spell out exactly what is needed. And I really like this idea from a blog post from Jason Yip uh, that his colleague uh, Alia Rose Connor suggested, which is transmission is not enough. You need to make sure that the message has been received, understood, agreed, and that someone's actually going to take action as a result of it. For successful execution, it's important to have empathy with the people who are going to have to do the work to achieve your goal. So you understand their needs, you anticipate their reactions. Think about what you could do to make things easier for them. 
provide ways for people to work asynchronously, uh, give them access they need, have detailed, accurate, friendly documentation, and, and let them set up their own keys. Make it easy for people to see how much work they've got left. We had a tool that, at the FT where we uh, called this single system view. One thing it surfaced was migration, so you could look at it and see what the progress was. This kind of visualization also catches places where people didn't realize they had to do something and you thought they did. It's very, very handy. If you can do the work for other teams, do. So for example, when we built a new change API uh, at the FT, we um, built a circle CI orb and we actually went and integrated that into uh, Teams pipelines for them. So that helped test our tools, it built productive working relationships, but it also just got those teams migrated. One final point about execution is make sure you finish a migration because there are two milestones in any migration. The first one is when the new store service is ready to be used. You should deprecate the old service. Make sure new cases are using the new service, but it's not the end because you're not finished until the old service is no longer used. Because until you do that, you're supporting two. You're spending time and money. People have to understand both services. It's additional cognitive load for teams, stuff you have to keep in mind. You really want to avoid hitting the first milestone and not getting to the second milestone. Set an end date. Make sure people know when that end date is. Because if you don't set an end date, you will still have some teams that have just not got around to it a year and a half later. Just want to go back, and I know I'm running over, but honestly, not much longer. Um, one more time to that story about the CRM migration, because what happened next was a great illustration to me about what happens when you have teams that are really autonomous. So over the year following the cancellation of the project, various stakeholder teams went and did the migration themselves. They did this independently when they had time to spend on it without requiring any coordination. The service desk bought the new service management tool. Uh, they, the evaluation all happened, they just went and bought it. Um, we actually, in the operations team, realized that what we most wanted to do was to set up an ability to manage incidents in Slack, so we did that. We built a new change API. Uh, we had done this to simplify the integration with the old system, but because we put all of the requests to log a change on a queue, we could now send it somewhere else and then move away from that system. The key thing was that the clarity that we had from that process was used uh, to work out what else needed to happen to move away. And we could, did it. A year later, we did not renew again. We had completed the whole thing. So in summary, uh, keeping things up to date can really impact flow. So you always have stuff that needs to happen, but you should be really careful and weigh up. Do you need to do this? And do you need to do it right now? You should invest in things that make it easier to handle upgrades and migrations. Have services that are owned, keep track of the upgrades coming your way, choose to build things that make it easier. And finally, make sure that you're clear about what is going to happen, communicate effectively, and consider the impact you're having on other teams. That is it from me today. I do talk a lot about this in my book, but basically, organizational and cultural challenges are at least as big as the technical side when you're moving to something like a microservice architecture. I have some copies to give away, which I'll be doing in the break. Uh, you'll also be able to buy it from the Agile stationery stand. Um, I'm an independent consultant, but I also work with Conflux, helping organizations to change the way they work to achieve better flow. And if you want to find more about how Conflux works, there's also a stand for Conflux at the conference. Thank you. <laughs>